compassion and love. May there be peace with each of us as we trust that you have placed us exactly where we were meant to be. May we not forget the infinite possibilities that are born of faith, faith of our fathers and mothers, faith of our teachers and mentors. May we continue to pass on the gift of thy grace freely given to us. We are grateful for the love that binds us in unity and solidarity. The love that upholds us in sickness, sorrow, and loss. We are grateful that the joy that brings us laughter and the inspiration that brings creativity is still within us. And give us the desire to serve and sacrifice. Give us the desire to dream and make dreams come true. And let your presence and Holy Spirit be ever present this day forth and forevermore. Amen. My friends, fellow alumni, it's hard for me to imagine that we are not here together. But imagination is a very important word. And imagination is what we have as a collective memory and our collective thoughts. And let's take a journey back in time, walk through the college campus, imagine the chapel, the sunken garden. And if you look up, you can see the women's hostel. And if you look to the right, you can see the old assembly hall with so many memories. And then we walk across the street to the abode of the gods, the men's hostel. Each of these memories is precious as we get older. I got a letter from my good friend Albert, who said, Macha, we're all getting older. He was in shock after our close friend Ajit had taken a bad fall. And he said, I guess we're getting older. And my classmate Prasad Reddy had passed away as well. But we can have flashbacks that are like supernovas in the sunset bringing back those joyful memories and energized times. Oh, it can be a quiet candle burning in the dark with a glow of inner peace and inner joy, a sanctuary within our souls. And so my friends, as we go through these difficult times, I want to read a poem to close my little talk. I know I'm supposed to say a lot of jokes and things like that, but I really couldn't bring myself to do that this time for some reason. But I'm so happy and joyful that we have this moment together. So my favorite, one of my favorite poems is a favorite poem of Nelson Mandela. It's called Invictus. Out of the night that covers me, black as a pit, from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears, looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Thank you. I now hand you back 
to Samson. Thank you, Siddhi. Thank you very much for that prayer, the lovely prayer, and for the poem. Uh, we are uh, usually the director of CMC Valor, or a representative from the directorate, addresses the GOTC gathering, and this year is no different. We have Dr. J.V. Peter, who's going to talk to us about what has happened uh, uh, in Valor in the past year, as well as the director's address. However, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to also acknowledge the results of disparity and the results of systemic oppression of black people, racial injustice, inequality, and brutality. I do not want to dwell on that. However, I'd like to also remind us that more than 150 years ago, somebody was born here in this country who chose not to dwell here, but go to India and take on that cause and subsequently devote her life to the pursuit of a vision as a result of which every one of us have not just our educations, but many of us have our spouses, and subsequent to her vision and her work, we have actually propagated that message so far beyond. The power of a positive vision and the power of ideas are something amazing. And that is exactly why we treasure Valor. So without further ado, off to Dr. J.V. Peter for the director's address. Great to meet you all through this platform. I bring warm greetings to you from Christian Medical College, Velo. This talk is supposed to be 10 minutes, so I'll try my best to present all the things that have happened over the last year. I'm going to speak about some of the challenges, the blessings, events and news, and then conclude. The challenge that stood out in 2019 was, please believe it or not, an unexpected flood that happened in CMC Velour. Thank God it lasted only for a few hours and the General Supreme's office was able to clear it quickly. In this year, we have been hit as much as the rest of the world has been by COVID-19. We did have adequate time to prepare and we are as ready as we possibly can be. Post release of lockdown, we are exp experiencing a surge in cases and more and more patients are presenting. This uh, slide shows you a snapshot of the several committees that are looking at COVID preparedness and its management. We are getting a few patients every day, and so we are able to effectively look after them. During the lockdown, we had problems with staff reporting for work, and so the transport department rallied around to bring about 1,000 to 1,300 staff daily through several bus trips. A lot of changes had to be made in the hospital area, in the outpatient areas. We created a separate fever clinic and a sampling kiosk. Physical distancing and wash areas were created. Casualty had to undergo modifications to segregate COVID suspects and non-COVID patients. The M block also was converted to be the COVID block because of the norms that were expected. A new intensive care unit was created with help from the Friends of Velour globally. We call it the STICO S Terrace ICU. And this is a snapshot of the unit as it was ready. And this is the one as it is now being filled with patients. We also had to create separate patient waiting areas with video conferencing facility because relatives of positive patients were not allowed into the main areas. There was also a lot of work done on movement mapping, creating donning and doffing areas, and a lot of work went on uh, by the teams that were looking after this uh, process. Several zoning concepts were discussed as to how we segregate patients. It has become more and more complex as time goes by. Along with the COVID, we have also experienced a lot of financial challenges because of drop in numbers. We have had a lot of discussions in the Finance Committee and Executive Committee, and several strategies have been planned to bridge the gap in finances. But it looks like inevitably we would need to have some bank borrowings to cover this gap. There were several blessings that we faced over the last year. I would say experienced. We 
we filed with petitions in the Supreme Court over the last few months regarding our NEET case in February. The judgment was reserved and the final judgment of the NEET case came out in April 2020. It is a 108 page judgment which made, made NEET mandatory for all institutions. But however, they said that NEET will not affect the rights of minority. This, despite this, the, uh, we are very happy to report that the admissions have gone on as usual. We were able to convert the diploma seats to postgraduate seats last year. And there was a significant increase in the number of postgraduate seats compared to last year. This year, the postgraduate admissions is going on and we were able to admit students with, uh, in all categories. Truly, we have experienced the hand of God amidst this. The last year has also been a year of networking with all our friends and alumni in different parts of the world. Uh, with people from multiple universities globally, with the central government, the state government. We've also been able to reach out for corporate social responsibility support. And we've had a lot more interactions with the government Vellore Medical College in Vellore. The development office has taken a lot of effort to raise funds. And we were able to uh, raise a record 23 crores in the last financial year. A lot of the gifts have come in kind. Uh, we have been able to get uh, face shields, bio suits, N95 masks, mattresses, sanitizers from various companies during this COVID pandemic. These uh, are the main uh, corporate social racing uh, activities and we are so grateful to our partners for having come forward to partner with CMC in all our activities ranging from primary care to trauma and high diagnostics, high-end diagnostics. We are also pleased to report that with the help of the foundation in the US, we were successful in the ASHA grant in 2018 for a $620,000 mother and child project. And for 2019, we have also been successful for a simulation and skills lab. Amidst all this, we were also blessed to admit the first batch of BSc nursing students in the College of Nursing Chittur campus. We have also been planning in the Kanigapuram campus, a pediatric center as part of phase two. And we are pleased to report that uh, a lot of progress has been made and we're looking to some philanthropists to support this entire project. Every year we have several events and uh, the last year was no different. We had the Aidaskara Humanitarian Oration, which is the foundation supported uh, project. We had our usual alumni reunion. Uh, it's unlikely that we will be able to have it in Velour this year. The other activities like Shiloh and Pegasus, the annual activities also happened last year. We also had our graduations, the UG, PG, Nursing and Allied Health. And we are looking at how we will be able to do this this year, we would probably need to postpone it till the end of this year or beginning of next year. CMC has also been in the news for several things. Uh, we are very pleased to report that the Bill Gates Foundation did a survey in India which reported that the Velu district has the best statistic for children surviving up to the age of five years. I think CMC has played a major role in getting the district to this point. There is also another report which says uh, that CMC is probably one of the cheapest comparing healthcare with other institutions within India and overseas. During this time of difficulty, CMC has reached out of their comfort zone to look after other people. We have provided food and accommodation to people who come to our institution and we have also reached out to the areas that we cover in Kanyambadi block, KV Kopum block, as well as in Jawadi. Not only dry groceries were supplied, LCCU for example cooked food for the urban poor who were really struggling during the lockdown period. We also instituted a scheme called the Manna Meal Scheme where our patients and the relatives who could not afford to buy food 
were given coupons to get food from the canteen. Uh, over 13,000 food coupons have been uh, distributed over the last few weeks. During this time, we have also reached out to ensure that continuity of care is provided to the people in Velo. The community health departments have reached out to continue their programs uh, to the villages during this time. A quick update on the projects. The old student nurses project, uh, it is supposed to be converted to a nursing, from a nursing hostel to an inpatient block. Work is slightly delayed. We hope it will be finished in the next few weeks. This is the artist's impression of how this block is going to turn out to be. The operating theaters are already ready and these are actual photographs of the operating theaters and the wards in the uh, new inpatient block in the town campus. Over the last year, we procured a fully automated COBAS system for the hospital. Uh, an ulcer ward was converted with the corporate social responsibility from uh, funds from State Bank of India and this is a new ulcer ward. We started off some services in a center called Anand Cardiac Center which was which we have leased and we have converted it into a CMC diagnostic and daycare center where family medicine is now running clinics on a daily basis. The assisted living center which is a project funded by the Friends of Velo is getting ready and it should be operational in the next few uh, weeks to months. The projects in Chavadi Hills are going on full swing. Uh, a little bit of lag during the uh, pandemic period, but a lot of activities are happening in the Chavadi Hills. Rusa acquired an autoclave with support from our alumni batches and the guest house in Rusa is also being modified over the last few months. In Chittur, work is proceeding uh, on uh, the creation of a working women's hostel and the Chatram. The Chatram is again a gift of the alumni belonging to the batch of 1991. The housing complex is ready and was dedicated in the January Council and people have started occupying these houses in Chittur campus. The radiology suite, uh, which is a new addition to the Chittur campus, will be operational from uh, August. We are very happy and grateful to God that the Kanigavaram residence campus is uh, getting ready. This was dedicated in March and we were privileged to have five former directors gracing this occasion and the residents have started moving into this campus as of this week. We also have been uh, working on the Kanigavaram uh, campus. This project has been delayed because of the lockdown but again I am very pleased to report that with the permission of the local collector, a couple of wards in the Kanigapuram campus have been dedicated for COVID. We are yet to admit patients there. We hope that from next month, we'll be able to get these wards operational. So in, in a phased manner, we are hoping to open the rest of the Kanigapuram campus and God willing, the whole campus should be ready by early next year. A few other aspects I would like to just quickly highlight before we finish. Uh, this year is the 150th birth anniversary of our founder, Dr. Aida Skader. We were hoping to do a lot of activities, but uh, because of this pandemic, it appears that we, it will be low key. But I thought I should uh, remind all of us that this is the 150th birth anniversary of our founder. So I want to conclude by saying that all this has been possible because of God's abundant pro provision and the support of so many well-wishers, friends, uh, alumni, administration and the committees that have worked together to provide uh, health care to the people around. I want to conclude with this song which is so meaningful at this time. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come or shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Dr. Peters. Warm greetings to you all from Christian Medical College, Velour. Friends, I was hoping to meet you all in person at the GOTC. However, it was not meant to be. 
nevertheless technology allows us to connect even though we are separated by vast distances i hope that you're all having a good time uh, meeting up with each other although through an electronic platform and particularly at this time i pray that god will keep you safe keep our uh, friends and family safe and that in due course we will all be able to meet and share the joy and happiness of friendship and fellowship god bless you all thank you dr peters for that wonderful uh, summary of what happened in valor and for your faith and the story of faith in valor that still continues from the amazing vision of our founder dr ida scudder we are now moving into the uh, talks you're in for a treat because uh, these these are superb and i just can't wait for you to go ahead and uh, listen to these talks first is going to be dr priya balasubramaniam and uh, just as uh, sudhi talked about the walk through hostel the walk through uh, women's hostel the chapel and the men's hostel this is of a person who was in velour and who writes about notes to a younger self dr priya balasubramaniam is also an author and uh, has published a book and many of you may have seen this through the velour news it is called the alchemy of secrets if you've not purchased a copy please do so it's available on amazon the proceeds from the book all the author's proceeds go to support two charitable foundations one of those is the distress fund for global cmc alumni and the other is the anna anna university foundation trust so without further ado off to dr priya balasubramaniam Hi everyone. I'm Priya Bala Subramanian. I'm from the batch of '91, and uh, hi everyone. I'm Priya Bala Subramanian. I'm from the batch of '91, and uh, I'm going to read a, a prose poem for you that I wrote uh, this week. Uh, it's for the toad. The current toadeter reached out and asked for an article, and I realized that things haven't changed very much. Um, just like when I was a toadeter, we're always chasing people for articles. And uh, so I'm just doing my part. Um, if there's other people here who haven't written for the toad, uh, please get in touch with me. I'll give you Shakina's uh, contact information. I'm sure she, uh, I'm sure they'd love to hear from you. So anyway, this prose poem, Blue's definition, is called uh, Note to a Younger Self. Um, and it goes like this. You stand alone on a hostel terrace and contemplate the world. If all your worries could be gathered up and measured, they would fit like a coin in the palm of your hand. Exam marks, career choices, or your chances at love. And mostly this, what does your future hold? The unknown, yes, but it's such a delicious gift for the unwrapping. You'll graduate soon. You will be a doctor. And forevermore, this hallowed institution that awed you as an interview candidate will be your home, your very own alma mater. This is the first of many dreams to come true. Had you ever believed that it could happen? So now you build multi-tiered fantasies that are dressed up as life goals. The world beckons, your heart is young. Would you settle for a goal that seems less than a dream? But about those dreams, my young friend, a word. They will be exacting taskmasters. Years will vaporize like seconds while you pursue them. There will be victories, of course, but also mistakes that feel terrible, even if they're ultimately inconsequential. None will hurt as much as the first. But it will take years and hindsight to see them as the stepping stones they were. It will never feel that way in the moment. You will build a family as you build your career, and you'll settle into a juggler's rhythm for all the competing responsibilities you've accepted. Physician, spouse, parent, child, 
sibling, in-law, colleague, you will probably lose touch with most of your current friends. You'll feel inadequate, sometimes on a daily and hourly basis. You will feel literally and completely alone sometimes. And at others, you'll wish you just had one minute alone. Somewhere along the line, you'll begin to ignore other people's opinions of you. If you're especially lucky, this will happen early because you look up a decade or two down the line and you'll wonder where all those years went, where you went, because you will be years and miles from that young adult you are now. You might hesitate to daydream. You think for longer before you speak at the very least. None of it will seem predictable. No straight arrow from that moment on the hostel terrace. Who'd have thought you'll ask yourself when the 25th reunion comes along? You'll be older than you can even imagine now. You'll take stock of your life, everyone does, and the moments of joy along the way will stand out. They will have been beyond your wildest expectations. You may be surprised. All those cliches you've heard about life and love are true. You could not have predicted how much a child's smile could move you. The rest, all those dreams you've chased for years, they matter, yes, but just a bit less. You'll go to reunions, you'll see your friends, the people you've loved and who, despite all the lost years, still love you. It will seem a joy, a quieter one perhaps, but one that means as much as your most ambitious dream come true. Um, that's the end of the poem, and I'd like to dedicate it uh, to the best batch of all, the batch of 91. And if you didn't like any part of the, the previous four minutes, please contact Roshni George, batch of 91. She'll know why. Um, and thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Priya, for that wonderful, wonderful poem. And it, it was so amazing. And uh, as you watch the years vaporize in seconds, and uh, also are you, as you're waiting to kind of meet your friends in the breakout room, I'd like to introduce the second speaker. Uh, he is from the greatest batch alive, the batch of 1985. And uh, in our younger self, we did not realize what a creative genius we had. He, this, this person used to write poems when he was in medical school. And uh, as uh, young fellows in medical school, we used to grab his poems out of him, read them out, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, actually give him a hard time when we were in medical school. Later, as we grew up, uh, some of us, we, we kind of read other things. We read the poems of David White and other creative writings, and we realized uh, our friend who actually wrote a poem which he said he's going to uh, go up on a hill and float it down to the girl he loved. And uh, he's going to talk. And he's going to talk about the connection, what Priya talked about, our uh, younger selves and uh, creativity and uh, the spy forces that shape your creative destiny. Without further ado, doc, the one and only Dr. Vineet Philip John. Hello, Global GOTC Forum. I'm Vineet John, batch of 85. When I was 10 years old, they gave us a creativity test in class. I still remember that test. It had puzzles, simple mathematical equations, geometric challenges, patterns and shapes. One had to find the right fit. A few weeks after the test, my teacher came back and gave us our answer booklets. He also told us what the highest score might be. I looked at my booklet. I had that score. Then he took the answer booklet back. But the thought stayed with me. I might be creative. Soon, time passed. I came to CMC. CMC was a heaven for me. I read a lot. I wrote a few poems and a few short stories, always uh, tinged with nostalgia and adolescent angst. That was all, nothing more. Fast forward 30 years, I'm in my early 50s, and I find myself thinking about that test. What if I had totally, truly, embraced my creative side. 
would I had lived a different life. So when Samson asked me to speak, I thought I could think a little bit more about this concept of creativity. Maybe we could decode um, this concept and, and that could give us the power to shape our own creative destiny. There are many, many definitions of creativity. This is one of my favorites. Creativity aspires to come up with a novel, original solution to a vexing, complex problems. This picture awes me, humbles me. These cave paintings may be about 20,000 years old, maybe even more. Our ancestors took time to express, to communicate, to build a platform for their creative spark, which was innate in them. The world was much more harsher and dangerous than our world. Despite all this rhetoric, which informs us that creativity is indeed the adaptive skill for the survival of a species, and that being creative helps us to lead much more richer and meaningful lives, we shy away from that topic. We remind ourselves that we have real adult responsibilities. We need to be serious, not playful. We trade our dreams for security as we fear failure, rejection, and ridicule. Also, we think uh, we know that kind of people, the so-called artsy creative types. How do we deconstruct creativity? In 1926, a British academic, Graham Wallace, set out to do exactly that. Though the Wallace model might be uh, kind of dated, I find much relief in its simplicity. Wallace said that our creative process would often go through four distinct stages. There's a stage of preparation, which is stage for collecting data and enhancing expertise. There is a stage of incubation, which is kind of a, a passive process. And then comes that stage of illumination, the Eureka moment, the gift of insight, the moment of epiphany. And then the final task, which is for verification implementation. For today's conversation, I try to look at five factors which could be important to shape our creativity. They are chance, collaboration, crisis, curiosity, and convergence. Let's look at chance first. The world as we know it could be the known world, the known unknown world, the unknown known world, or the unknown unknown world. Serendipity is about making fortunate discoveries by accident. Serendipity could be a skill or quality to see hidden patterns or to explore the unknown unknowns. Turns out that there is a science to serendipity. It goes through various facets. The first facet is to have a prepared mind and then something magical, accidental, completely unexpected happens. You notice something. You've never made the connection before. And then something fortuitous happens and an outcome which is happy ensues. Now, while all this is going on, you still are not thinking it's serendipitous. It's only in the retelling of the story, in the reframing of the tale, you realize that you were at the right time at the right place. And most importantly, because of your interest, your expertise, your passion, your personality, you were indeed the right person. The pages in the book of history of medicine is full of serendipitous uh, events. In 1928, Alexander Fleming returns to his messy office after a vacation, and he notices a curious pattern in a dairy agar plate. This led to the discovery of penicillin notatum, and that led to extraction of penicillin, which saved lives of millions of soldiers in World War II. These two serious looking dudes are Barry Marshall and Robin Warren, both Australian physicians. But they came up with this elegant idea that there were bacilli in the stomach and H. pylori is behind gastric ulcers. They did that with no research funding, but by sheer accident. In 1982, an MRSA infection made the lab keep their samples for three days longer. Turns out that H. pylori takes five days to grow. 
a new era, new era in gastroenterology was ushered in. Gastric ulcers and gastric cancers became much rarer. Bieta, the diabetic medicine, came out of the observation of a VA doctor, Dr. Joseph Eng, who realized that the saliva of the Gila monster, that scary little reptile I showed you earlier, contained a chemical which affected glucose control. Another blockbuster drug, Viagra, the little blue pill, came to be when patients, elder, especially elderly men, failed to return samples of an ineffective antihypertensive agent they had been given for a clinical trial. My own specialty of psychiatry owes most of its pharmacological armamentarium to serendipitous discoveries. Let's admit it. We are all like the character in the Tom Cruise movie, Jerry Maguire, who says, you complete me. We constantly, we are looking for somebody who is what we call a compensatory genius. Someone who could make up for our weak spots, but then they have to be equally smart and brilliant as us. No better example for this than from the world of music, John Lennon and Paul McCartney. John was impatient, rude, impertinent, messy, but superbly talented. Paul, on the other hand, was cool, calm, organized, and most importantly, he could keep up with John. This study is really cool. Right now, we are in the midst of social distancing, stay-at-home order, and most of our communication with the peers are on the virtual space. This study examined whether physical proximity really mattered in breakthrough creativity. They studied biomedical Harvard researchers between 1993 and 2003, and they geocoded the physical locations of the offices. And they looked at the impact factor of the authors who worked very close together. Looks like that if you worked very close together, you are able to come up with high impact factor journal articles. And if you are further and further away, your uh, journal articles lacked high impact. Curiosity is a third force. It is indeed a fuel for creativity. Curiosity is the basic motivation to learn and explore so as to attain further knowledge and skill. Leonardo da Vinci was known for his curiosity. He was called the most curious among men. Da Vinci wanted to know about everything. He wanted to know about the nature, the intricate details of the human anatomy, mechanics of flying in birds. Part of being curious is about asking the right kind of questions. Here is what happened to this middle manager from an independent coffee company in Seattle. In 1982, he was on a trip to Italy and he found the coffee culture alluring. There were a whole community around the culture, the baristas, the regular customers. He asked himself, why don't I take it uh, back to the US? You know where the story is going and the eventual result was the formation of Starbucks, and the man's name is Howard Schultz. Crisis. In 1970, there was an explosion that left the Apollo 13 spacecraft leaking oxygen. Three astronauts' lives were at stake. The dream of lunar landing was next. NASA engineers were directed to create a filtration system utilizing components easily available to the astronauts. They did just that. In the midst of the current crisis, we can find inspiration from NASA's playbook. We should tell ourselves that failure is not an option. And correctly, daily we are hearing of testing breakthroughs which deliver COVID results in minutes. There is such a dazzling display of creativity in designing PPEs and vaccines and other treatments. Crisis is indeed creative. Today, right now, this very moment, COVID pandemic has brought the world to its knees. Our traditional knowledge has failed to mount a satisfactory response. Globally, around 413,000 human lives have been lost. There is a term in complexity science. It's called Medici effect. Medici effect refers to the time in history where there is confluence of ideas, culture, and thought. 
It is when diverse industries, disciplines meld, intersect, clash, and cross-pollinate. And then novel insights emerge because of their convergence. Breakthrough ideas occur when we are able to transport concepts from one field to a new, unfamiliar territory. Creativity that way occurs not at the center, like we see here, but very much in the periphery, in novel intersections of different disciplines. Convergence medicine may be our hope against COVID. It will foster mutual learning, innovative collaborations, and create a transdisciplinary knowledge to solve complex and cataclysmic problems. How do we decode creativity? We have to connect the dots and be prepared for serendipity in our lives. We should make time for daydreaming. We should be in the lookout for our creative partner. Even when we are in crisis, let that inspire us to be more creative. Constantly be curious, asking the right question. And if possible, place ourselves at the intersection of fields to innovate. We should start doing more of what we love and less of what we hate. Thank you, GOTC. Awesome, Vineet. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. And as you kind of go through uh, the next talk, you realize the word crisis. Originally, it is a medical word, and it's meant to signify a phase in the clinical illness when the illness either gets better or worse. And that is the etymology of the word crisis. And as you go through crisis, what differentiates an organism is the presence of resilience. And uh, our next speaker needs no introduction. Margaret Kumar, who's going to probably be doing the chapel service, and she's going to self-introduce herself, and she's got a very, very nice talk, a very personal talk on resilience. Mabel, can you play that? Greetings, my name is Margaret Kumar, and I'm a College of Nursing graduate of 1963. And it's my pleasure to talk to you today about a subject that's pretty close to my heart. And I've entitled it Resilience, Living in the Moment. We all know that resilience is important for living a meaningful life. It's pretty obvious. But what really is resilience? Is it something that just some few fortunate people have? Or can anyone become resilient? I think personally it's about navigating challenging times and using strategies for adapting and pivoting during those periods of uncertainty. But mainly it's about providing inspiration both to ourselves and to others to go forward. And why is resilience important? Uh, especially in these times, we've heard so much about the times we're living in. And if we are resilient, we will be able to face and overcome and even become personally strengthened by the challenges and problems that we face. Resilience doesn't make the problems go away. It doesn't resolve problems. It just helps us to cope and adjust and stay on our feet. <clears throat> the concept of resilience has been studied since 1970s, in the early 1970s, specifically by one contemporary and very impactful social researcher by the name of Dr. Brene Brown. I'm sure you've heard her on various TED Talks. She speaks and writes extensively on this topic and I would highly recommend you looking into her books to learn about resilience. In one of her books, The Gifts of Imperfection, she defines resilience as the ability to overcome adversity and she lists several major protective factors that research shows makes people resilient. These include having good problem solving skills, seeking help from others, believing in our own ability to cope, and perhaps most importantly, being connected to and supported by other people such as family and friends. And to these traits, Dr. Brown adds spirituality, compassion, courage, and the ability to be vulnerable. She strongly believes that if we understand and embrace our own pain through adversity, uh, then we'll be able to have compassion for others' pain. And that's a key element to live 
a very meaningful life, what she calls wholehearted living. And these uh, abilities may be natural for some people, but they can be learned and cultivated by others as well. Now, there are many definitions for resilience, but my favorite one is resilience is the self-writing tendencies of a person, both the capacity to be bent without breaking and the capacity once bent to be able to spring back. Uh, we often hear the word bounce back in relation to being resilient. I really don't think we can ever bounce back to where before it happened. Uh, but we can get to a place where we can live a meaningful, integrated life while we gradually adjust to what is what becomes our new normal. And when lived through the suffering and death of my dear husband, uh, Surendra Kumar, who was a 1960 CMC um, graduate, I understand what resilience means as you go through that, that really tough time. Um, when you come out at the other end, this is what I faced. There's no room for regrets, even though there, there's extreme grief. There's no room for whining and complaining when there's deep gratitude for the years that we had together. There's no room for envy and anger when there's hope um, to see each other again because of what we believe. We bounce back, but we bounce back to a different place. And what helped me more than anything else is what I've been teaching and nursing for the last 40 years about how we live in three different circles. One is a circle of control. Our circle of control isn't even that big. I mean, what do we actually have control over? Maybe our reactions, maybe what we say, but even that, sometimes things come out of our mouth and we don't even realize we've said it. Our circle of control is so, so small. And yet, we spend inordinate amounts of time and energy and money and resources on our circle of no control, which is as big as the universe. There is absolutely nothing we truly can control. <clears throat> how we feel, how, um, what, you know, what other people think or say or do, what happens in the world, um, the weather. There's so many things. We can't even control our toddlers. <clears throat> but as we say, we spend so much time worrying about those things we can't control because I think we're wired to be control freaks. However, there's another circle. It's called the circle of influence. And I think each of us are surrounded by the circle of influence that can be as big or as small as we want it to be. It can be as positive or as negative as we want it to be. That's what we can control, how we impact other people. We can't do too much about uh, things that we can't control. We can't do too much about things that we can control. As the baseball player Mickey Rivers said, I'm not going to worry about things I can't control because I can't control them. So there's no point worrying about them. And I'm not going to control or worry about things I can control because I can control them. And there's no point worrying about them. Uh, I cannot tell you how much that helped me uh, when I was going through my adversity to realize all I can do is to live a life that is impactful. And, um, you know, um, in 1996, during the Olympics, there was a sports caster called Charlie Jones, and he spoke to a number of the in, uh, Olympic rowers. And every time he asked them a question about you know, things that were outside their control, like the weather or the, their opponents or what might go wrong or what their weaknesses were, they would always respond with this one little phrase, that's outside my boat. By refusing to focus on anything 
other than what they could control in their boat. They brought all their resources to bear on their, their control, their physiology, their mental maps, and their own preparation and how they prepared for the Olympics. And so I think if we focus much of our lives on our circle of influence, we will come out at the other end of truly resilient people. So in my experience, here are a few short takeaways um, that might help. Number one, we need to stop comparing ourselves with other people. There will always be people who do things better than us or do things worse than us. And if we uh, play the comparison game, we're going to run into too many opponents that we cannot uh, defeat. The other thing is, you know, stop mentally putting ourselves down. We can't develop high esteem if we repeat negative responses about ourselves and our abilities and whatever, whether we're speaking about our appearance, our career, our relationships, our financial situation, any other aspects of our lives, we need to stop being negative about it. But also avoid hubris and narcissism about ourselves. That is so unattractive. The other thing we can do is start to give more. Uh, not just financially, because many of us are in a position to help. And it may seem odd that giving to others helps us get through our own problems. But keeping our commitments to ourselves, our families, our friends, or commitments to a cause, such as volunteering or to CMC or whatever, they're very helpful ways to take the focus off our problems and expand our life skills and our problem solving skills to help others. As we help others, we don't have time to feel sorry for ourselves. The other thing to do is to keep the right perspective. When resilient people face adversity, they're likely to avoid making things worse by jumping to extremes. Resilient people tell themselves, this is not going to last forever. This too shall pass. I don't see every bump in the road as a catastrophe. Um, I understand that things are not perfect. I am not perfect. I need to have realistic expectations of myself and others and the situations that are around me and focus on what I can do, not what I can't do. That perspective is so important. And then finally, find strength beyond yourself. For me, when things get most difficult, there's only one place for me to go and to turn to, and that's up. Look to God. Sometimes life is filled with challenges that stretch us so far that we fear that we may break or never snap back. We might find ourselves struggling to make sense of our emotions, our thoughts, our very purpose for life. In times like these, I think they require more than human strength. In the dark moments, um, I really encourage you to bring your pain to God. He not only knows how to comfort you, but to bring you through a pain into a better life. And if you reach out to him, he will bring you through. Resilience also signifies hope for the future. This means we have established a philosophical framework that says, all my personal experiences can be interpreted with the meaning and hope, even in life's hopeless moments. So I strive to live an integrated life. I, I recognize that I must focus on God's love for me, and it's not something I can do alone. I am so grateful to my friends, um, especially my CMC colleagues who have reached out to me. God meant for us to live in community, connected to one another, drawing strength and encouragement from one another. And this can only be done if we are vulnerable enough to reach out and share your suffering with others. And, and then you get the courage then to reach out and show compassion to a, a, somebody else. Ultimately, personally, my resilience is built on my connectedness to Jesus Christ, who gives me purpose and meaning and who's the greatest protective factor of my resilience in spite of my own human maladaptive tendencies. So I encourage you, live in that circle of influence 
Forget about the things you can't control. Forget about the things you can control. But live as resilient people. Thank you very much. Margaret, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. And uh, I feel like uh, we've already had the chapel service. Uh, thank you, thank you again for that uh, wonderful. <laughs> The circle of control, the circle of no control, the bumps in the road, that, that is specifically the area because uh, we are, I think, uh, it, is, it is the opposite because our circle of control is now reduced to the size of the virus. Everything else is beyond our control. That is exactly what this pandemic has taught us. And uh, for those of you who joined uh, now, please be aware that this program is being recorded. We're up to about 126 participants at this point in time, and there are probably lots more people watching. And uh, we went through uh, uh, the talk by Dr. J.B. Peter, uh, addressing where CMC has been and uh, all the things that happened in the last year and his hope for the future. Dr. Priya Balasubramaniam spoke about notes to a younger self. Vineet talked about creativity, and uh, Dr. Kumar talked about resilience. And as you look at the circle of control and the circle of no control, I also am uh, pressed to recognize the healthcare workers. Many of you have been in the forefront of the fight against COVID. And lots of you have uh, had lost, we've lost people from below who made the ultimate sacrifice. We've also lost friends, we've lost family members, we've lost patients. And for all of that, especially as we go through that, may God give us the strength to be able to both sustain ourselves, be resilient, and also march back towards success. And we do hope in a better tomorrow. And with that, the last person on the talk is gonna give us a talk, which is gonna talk about your circle of control. How do you enhance that circle of control? And when you get that bump on the road, what do you do about the bump on the road so that you don't feel those bumps? And the person who's gonna do that is Dr. Alok Khalia. He's from the batch of 1967. He lives here in uh, sunny Texas and in Houston, and he's gonna take us into that next spot. This is a awesome talk, one of the best talks I've ever seen on meditation. And I promise you, we, we actually have been sent to multiple seminars to meditate and to do these things. I've not uh, had a presentation of this caliber. So enjoy. Greetings, friends. I'm calling this presentation the case for meditation. I have meditated on and off for the past 20 years and with the pandemic more on than off and I'm in good company. Michael Jordan, Derek Jeter, Kobe Bryant, they all meditate. Why? What can meditation do for you and me? Many things. Today I'm going to focus on three benefits of meditation that I strive for and occasionally, briefly achieve. First, meditation trains the mind to abide calmly in the present moment. Let me repeat. Meditation trains the mind to abide calmly in the present moment. These are stressful times. Think of life as a horse-drawn cart that is always moving forward, day after day after day, clip-clop, clip-clop. You cannot stop the cart of life. Imagine that there is a piece of gum stuck to the edge of one of the wheels of that cart. The cart is moving forward. Is the gum moving forward in harmony with the cart? Not at all. As the wheel rolls, the gum is going back and up and forward and down and back and up and forward and down and back and up and forward and down. The stressed out mind is like that. It's like that piece of gum. It keeps spinning back to the same thoughts over and over and over again. It runs around in circles. It cannot focus. It is too tired to enjoy life. Have any of you been there? I have. Now, pick up that piece of gum and stick it to the center of that wheel. Now it's moving in a straight line. It's still going round and round. 
It is seeing everything, observing everything. It is experiencing every bump and pothole that the cart of life goes over. But it is not distracted. It is focused. It is moving ever forward. It is in harmony with life. Meditation centers the gum. It helps the mind break out of those repetitive circular thoughts about things that we cannot control. And in doing so, it lowers the stress level. Talking of the stress level, we inherited our stress response, the so-called fight or flight response from our cave dwelling ancestors. And I'm sure that our ancestors, just like us, stressed about emotional issues. But the fight or flight response appears to be designed primarily to react to physical danger. We don't face too many physical threats these days, so we should have no stress at all. But we feel more stressed than ever. It's because our stress response machinery, which is alive and well, responds to real or imagined mental and emotional threats in exactly the same way that it responds to physical threats. And our emotional threats have far outstripped any physical threats. Why is that? Well, on the average, we are living much, much longer and more comfortably than our distant ancestors. But the comforts and safety that lead us to expect a long life come with, they come with a catch, goals and expectations for the future. Now that we have so much, we want more. Professional success, personal comforts, more money, a bigger house, a better car, a larger TV, the best schools and colleges for our children. These expectations involve setting goals, consciously or subconsciously. And what is a goal? A goal is the desire and the attempt to have the future unfold my way. But the future is not always under our control. Goals are not always achieved and we know this. And if the goal is important to us, this can lead to apprehension, the fear of failure. Apprehension can be defined as dragging the future into the present and worrying about it. How many of you have stressed about your child getting into a good college or even while waiting for the result of a medical test? Well, one day the future becomes the present and the goal was not met. What's done is done, but we can't let it go. We have regrets. Regret can be defined as dragging the past into the present and stressing about it. Regret is saying, I wish. I wish this had not happened. I wish that had not happened. So we drag the future into the present and we stress about it. And we drag the past into the present and we stress about it. And then there is the final stress. The stress response is activated, but unlike with a physical threat, we can neither fight nor flee from negative emotions. So the stress response is triggered, but it is given no release. And it simmers. And simmering stress is not good. Meditation helps to clear the future and the past from the present. So we can focus on what needs to be done now instead of worrying about an uncertain future and an unchangeable past. Meditation centers that gum. That's the first benefit. Remember the gum. 
Secondly, meditation helps to create a separation between our mind and our thoughts. Your mind and your thoughts are not the same thing. But the stressed out mind is trapped inside its own thoughts and desires. And wherever the thoughts and desires want to go, the mind has no choice but to go along. So if the thought arises, let's have some chocolate cake, the trapped mind is dragged along. When you are trapped inside your thoughts, your thoughts are the director of the movie of your life. And you are just a passive actor. Meditation changes you into a movie critic sitting in the audience. Now the mind is separate from the thoughts. Now you can dispassionately examine your thoughts and desires and decide to act on them or not. So when the thought arises, let's have some chocolate cake, you can sit back, examine the thought and say, I don't think so. That is the second benefit. You are not a slave to your thoughts and desires. Can you imagine how liberating this can be in everyday life? Finally, meditation can change the way you interact with others, the way you live your life. How's that? Suppose you go to Mexico for vacation every year, year after year after year. Each time you come back, you will bring a small piece of Mexico back with you. Perhaps a wall hanging, maybe a piece of pottery. After 10 years of doing this, if someone new comes to visit you, she will look around your living room and say, oh, you go to Mexico often. Meditation works in the same way. Each time you meditate, you open a door and you walk away from this world of stress and worry into a world of calm. And when you come back, you bring some of that calmness back with you. If you do this regularly, you will find that your personality is changing ever so slightly. Every word, every action becomes a little more thoughtful, more deliberate, more reflective. You can handle stress producing events without getting stressed out, at least not as stressed as you used to become. This is the third benefit. So you ask, how much do I need to meditate every day? It does not matter. Meditating regularly is more important than meditating long. Start with a few minutes and work up as you feel comfortable. That's what I did. How to meditate? Breath meditation is the simplest. You sit comfortably on your chair, feet planted on the ground, eyes closed, and you just focus on your breath as it goes in and out. If you want to learn more about meditation, let me suggest a few resources. First is a book. It's called 10% with the percent sign, 10% happier. It's written by Dan Harris. Dan is the anchor of ABC's Good Morning America on weekends. As a young reporter, Dan saw too much death and bloodshed in Iraq and Afghanistan and he developed PTSD without realizing it. When he returned to the US, he got into drugs, cocaine and ecstasy and ended up having a drug induced meltdown on live TV in front of 5 million people. This book is about Dan's journey into meditation. It's a great resource. I recommend it. And then there are a couple of apps that I find myself using. 
The first is called 10% Happier, just like the book. It's a great resource for the beginning meditator. Try it out. Another app that I use almost every day is called Calm, C-A-L-M. It's good for meditation and if you have insomnia, as I sometimes do, Calm has dozens of stories that help me drift off to sleep. It helps. So to summarize, we can fight or flee from physical danger, but we cannot run away from negative emotions because these exist within our own mind. So the solutions also have to address the mind. And one of these solutions is meditation. And meditation has made me a little bit happier. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Alok, for that presentation. There are some words from Alok which always stick to you. In one of the presentations that he had, he talked about slices of pizza and he memorably said, you only have so many slices of pizza in your life and if you eat it up, you're done. And now you remember the gum. So this is exactly how it is. Uh, again, as for those of you who are on, on and who will probably be watching the recorded session, it is amazing as to how well each one of the folks who, are, who were asked to present did their presentations. They took time in order to prepare and the message almost kind of flows through as you notice. Right from the first presenter about the uh, story of our CMC Valor and then uh, on to Vineet about creativity and then uh, Margaret about resilience and now about meditation. 